and they seem to be able to maintain uh, wetlands at the regional scale through extended droughts, which is really cool for thinking about uh, climate change because it shows that beavers might be able to control the environment enough that they can provide refugia for plants and animals. Great. Yeah, we can do that. Yikes. <laughs> oh, do you want me to talk, talk about this? Or? Um, oh, is this an extra slide? Uh, yeah, I guess I hadn't revisited my slides. This just shows diversity change in these lakes. So these are the lakes that we studied uh, using sedimentary techniques, sedimentary DNA. And we saw significant increases in diversity at the same time that we see beavers arriving in the lakes where we see beavers. And then in that top lake, Jenny Lake, there's no beavers there, no change in diversity. This is just what it looks like to sample sedimentary DNA from a lake core. We suit up like that to protect the DNA from the ancient fragmented low quantity DNA from our high quality modern DNA. <laughs> Great. Yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Jesse Moravec, and I am in the last year of my PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I'm primarily a freshwater ecologist, and I also study beavers. Um, here we're looking at a beautiful photo of, uh, from Emily, actually, of beaver dams um, in California. Um, our work is focused on thinking about how restoring beaver populations in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California could influence water resources. Specifically, we're interested in how restoring beaver populations and restoring specifically beaver dam building activity could influence surface water storage and also water movement through a river network over time. We are taking a modeling approach to answer this question. We're collaborating with the Center for Biological Diversity and the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And by collaborating with NASA, that means we get to use their really high quality, sophisticated land surface models, which help us incorporate the best available remote sensing data and ground-based data and allow us to understand how water moves across the landscape uh, when you put a bunch of beaver dams on the landscape at really high densities. Um, this is important because in California, we have been experiencing increasingly warmer and drier climates. And those things coupled with extreme temperature events can lead to drought conditions. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we're expecting to see Sierra Nevada snowpack decline by somewhere between 60 to 85% under a variety of climate scenarios. And so those things make us concerned about California's water resources. And so, um, you know, we don't think that beavers can solve all of California's water problems, uh, but we do hypothesize that restoring beavers on the landscape and restoring their dam building cap uh, activity could increase surface water storage and slow down the movement of water through a river network, which is an important component of water storage. Um, and these are just hypotheses. We don't have any results yet. Um, we haven't uh, quite completed the project. So get back to me in a couple of months and I will have updates for you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we're really excited to be doing this work, especially in California where beaver restoration is really just taking off. Beaver, uh, California is getting on the beaver train. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're excited to be looking at this across the state. These are just more beautiful beaver pictures. Mm -hmm. There's another one. That's the Sierra Nevada mountain range. <laughs> <laughs> this is a modeling project, so there are not a lot of cute pictures of me doing anything other than <laughs> sitting at a computer. <laughs> um, and that actually like, tees perfectly up uh, for me. My name is Krista Kelleher. I am an assistant professor at Lafayette College out in Pennsylvania. Um, I am a civil engineer and a hydrologist by training. And I look a lot at how humans shape hydrological processes, which is how I came to the world of beaver, primarily through uh, beaver dam analogs, uh, which are basically uh, humans trying to mimic exactly all of the wonderful things that Jesse was just talking about. So we know a lot about beaver. We know a lot about, about the benefits of beaver and, and how they uh, essentially are keeping water on the landscape. But sort of unknown is when we try to mimic them, when we try to build dams like them, uh, are we able to, to get those same benefits? Um, so this is a picture of a beaver dam analog from uh, my field site out in Lander, Wyoming, uh, where we're working with the Nature Conservancy. And uh, you can see it's it's very simple, right? We have a couple of vertical posts pounded into the ground. Uh, a lot of times this is packed with um, mud, rocks down at the bottom, again, much like beaver would do. 
Uh, we weave it with willow and other uh, types of vegetation. Um, and then we don't just want one of these, we, we want multiple, right? My, much like how beaver would, would build in the landscape. Um, and these are intended to be relatively short-lived and dynamic by design. The idea is, right, traditional stream restoration. I'm an engineer, I can say bad things about engineers, we'll say. Um, <laughs> we would put physical things in the channel and, and sort of expect them to, to restore the stream to, to a natural state. The idea here is these are dynamic. They're going to change. They're going to break down. We're letting the stream do the work for us. Um, next slide. And uh, these are some images from, from where we're working. Um, out in Lander, Wyoming, showing you 2017, no, no BDAs, and 2023, where we now have um, on the order of 45 BDAs in the landscape. Uh, you will see BDAs in a variety. Oh, Sorry. all good. My bad. <laughs> so why BDAs? You might be saying, like, why do we need these beaver are so good at, at doing what they do? Um, there, there are places where either, obviously, beaver have been extirpated or places that can't sustain beaver dams. Um, or places where beaver just don't want to be. And so a lot of times when we build these structures, uh, you might reintroduce a beaver who will then try to try to do some upkeep on these dams. Um, we're doing a lot of on the ground monitoring and then and then some drone monitoring as well um, to look at how these structures change through time, how they reshape the landscape, um, and how long they actually are sustained. Uh, one of the things we're seeing right is beaver are really good at, at repairing their dams. So, we as humans, we got to go in and repair these too. These last about a year at our field site. Okay. Cool. So my name is Emily Fairfax, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Geography, and I'm also affiliated with the St. Anthony Falls Lab. So I've been studying beavers for a long time and have a lot of different beaver projects going on. Uh, most of my work has been on drought and wildfire resilience around beaver ponds and beaver wetlands, and that is research that I've expanded this year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on my next little slide. I've also been thinking a lot and working on the historic distribution of beavers across North America. We know that there were anywhere from 100 to 400 million beavers on this continent prior to the fur trade, and that that population crashed down to about 100,000 at its lowest point. They're on the rebound today, and as they move back into all these watersheds, a lot of us are asking, do beavers belong here? When was the last time they were here? And can this landscape still support them? One of the ways that we think about beaver restoration and conservation has to do with where do we actually have beavers today and where do we not? And to help answer that question, one of the very cool projects I've been working on recently is building a machine learning model to find beaver dams in satellite and aerial imagery automatically. Um, I've been doing this with a team at Google and it's been extremely helpful because uh, most people have not mapped out beaver dams by hand all day, every day, but it is a slow process <laughs> and your eyes hurt and you're 10,000 dams deep and that is just setting the foundation for the research you want to do. And so what this model has done is it's made it so that we can go ahead and scan all of that aerial imagery automatically, narrow down, find the beaver dams and move on to actually answering our research questions instead of spending all that effort on the searching process. All of this is informing a lot of restoration and relocation work that I've been involved in as well. We do have places across North America where beavers are currently absent, were historically present, but are having a hard time getting back there. The landscape that we had 250 years ago when we had all those beavers is not the same landscape we have today. Beavers are very awkward. Crossing highways is hard for them. Getting past human-made dams is hard for them. And so sometimes when we want to restore them to watersheds, that involves picking them up and putting them there. So we research the best ways to do that and try to make sure that we're ensuring the safety and well-being of the beavers and also accomplishing the restoration goals at hand. And that really informs strategic beaver conservation planning. So thinking not just about how do we get a beaver out of a conflict situation and put it somewhere else, but how can we use that opportunity of moving that beaver to build fire resilience and to build drought resilience across the landscape. Next slide. This is a pretty typical beaver wetland that you would see post wildfire. You've got absolutely incinerated forest around it and floodplain that's burnt to crisp on the other side of it. But the beaver wetland itself is preserved from the fire. Beavers accomplish this through a number of different ways, the two most important things being water storage and vegetation structure composition changing, so all those chewing behaviors that we sometimes have conflict with helps build fire resistance. And the new research that I presented this year, we found that this is not just a phenomenon in the American West. You might think about this as mostly a Western U.S. problem and Western U.S. solution, but we have seen uh, fire-resistant beaver wetlands in wetter places like Minnesota and Ontario, and even up in the Arctic and Alaska. And this is very important because wildfire is a significant disaster and can really harm human life and human infrastructure, but it's also massive carbon emission uh, 
situation when you have really large wildfires, especially those that are burning heatlands like we see in Canada, Alaska, and Minnesota, you can release a lot of greenhouse gases. Beavers are reducing the burned area. They could potentially reduce those emissions as well. Next slide. This, nope, that's the right one. You can skip that one. That's just beaver dams. <laughs> Um, and so I mentioned we're doing strategic relocation and conservation. Um, just yesterday was announced uh, an effort that we did this fall in California. It was the first beaver relocation the state has undergone in 75 years. And this one was unique in that we did it explicitly for climate mitigation and wildfire risk reduction. So these beavers were taken out of a conflict situation and over months and months and months of planning, we identified a site where they would be providing drought and fire resilience benefits, where they would also have habitat they'd be safe in and could thrive in uh, and so far it's been extraordinarily successful and it's very, very special getting to carry a beaver across a dry, crispy floodplain and put them in a beautiful wetland to make it even better. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thanks to our panelists for those quick, short and snappy introductions. Um, now we can just open it up to questions. Um, again, feel free just to sort of hop in, you know, we'll you know, pop in or we'll call on you. Um, and for folks online, um, you can either raise your hand and we'll call on you and unmute, uh, or you can type your question into the chat and we can just read it for you if you prefer that, so. Go ahead. Where were the beavers reintroduced in California? So they were reintroduced into a meadow called Tasman Coyam up in Northern California on the Western slope of the Sierra. It's Mountain Maidu Consortium land. Okay, and how close are people to that? You know, is it a woolly area or is it like remote? It's fairly remote. There are established campgrounds within the watershed. There's dirt roads that run through it. It's not like we we didn't hike them in for miles. Uh, we can't. I mean, those are 60 pound beavers. So like, <laughs> I'm not that strong. Um, but they are a little bit more remote. We didn't want to immediately introduce the beavers into another potential conflict situation. So we found a place where there were willing and excited uh, land managers. So the Mountain Maidu were very happy to welcome the beavers back to their land, but they also had a little bit of isolation to protect them from human interference, especially when they're getting established. Barbara, did you have something? Oh, yeah. I just had a question for Krista. Can you tell me like what, what are you trying to accomplish on the landscape with the yeah. beaver dam analogs? Um, so this this is a landscape in particular where um, beaver have, have been for a while. They've, they've um, been living in the upper portions of the watershed, but the downstream portions um, have been degraded by this this cycle of wet to dry from mm. from year to year to year. And so um, we've been working with the conservation um, manager at this particular property, and and his goal is really to see can we reestablish and reconnect the floodplain to the stream, um, and can we use these beaver dam analogs to attenuate uh, high flows and and raise low flows. Um, it's hard to do that, it turns out. It's hard to monitor things like that. Um, they're also really curious about um, when we raise the water table, does that mean that we're just basically moving all that water to vegetation and then out into the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. And uh, preliminarily, we are seeing that that is really not the case. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really see big differences in evapotranspiration rates between the areas that, that are sustained by beaver dam analogs and those that are a little further upstream. People like to call beavers what? Engineers. So maybe you can just list or anybody. Uh, what are they doing that's helpful for how many different species, how many different plants, or just in rough terms? I'll take a stab at this one first. Everyone else can add on. So beavers engage in a number of different ecosystem engineering behaviors that change the landscape. The most obvious is the dam construction, and that's going to build upon and create aquatic habitat. So any species that is an aquatic habitat obligate, like a fish, is going to benefit from that. It's more area for them to occupy. There tends to be a lot of food accumulating in these systems. Beavers are also going to be chewing trees, and they selectively chew trees that have evolutionarily gotten to a point where they want to be chewed. So willow, for example, is one of their favorite foods. Willow tends to thrive and grow stronger when it is being routinely coppiced by those beavers. So they chew it, it sprouts right back out. They also love things like aspen. They chew it, it clones right back out. It keeps that forest in a healthy, regenerating state. Something like about 80% of terrestrial species do need access to a riparian wetland or a creekside wetland at some point in their life cycle. Wetlands are one of the most rare landscapes that we have, especially in North America. We've lost anywhere from 50% to 90% of our wetlands, depending on what state you're in. And so in that sense, 80% of terrestrial species are going to be benefiting from the engineering work that beavers do. And then you guys talked about drought resilience. Maybe you can explain how that works. 
Yeah. Um, so the drought resilience around beaver ponds, when they build that dam, it's going to slow the water down. It doesn't stop it entirely. The dam is a leaky structure. Water goes under, around, through, over. But it's slowed down, and it has better connection to the floodplain and the floodplain soils. So not only do you have water that otherwise would have maybe flowed all the way downstream into the big rivers by March or April during snowmelt, it's going to be delayed. It's going to be hanging up there in this slower pathway until maybe May or June or July. You're also putting water out into the soil where it's on a much slower flow path. And so the earth sort of fills up like a great big sponge. There's lots of water in it, and it takes a lot longer to drain that water out. So all of the plants that are around the beaver wetland have access to this soil water storage and that surface water storage in the ponds, even through prolonged periods of drought. I've personally studied this and seen it uh, up to three years of significant drought resistance around these beaver wetlands, even in the deserts, even in severe drought, even when there's been months without precipitation. As long as they had enough time to get that water stored in the first place, it's going to be available to the ecosystem until every single last drop has flowed away. This is let's following right up on that. Um, with the beavers in place, if there were heavy rains instead of drought, like coming out of drought, if there were heavy rains like we had last winter. Do you think there's a scenario in which those wetlands could actually help with water penetration deeper, like for groundwater storage or replenishment? I definitely think they can. Most of the research on beaver wetlands during flood events has looked at flood wave attenuation, and so just taking the power out of that flood so that it's less destructive downstream. There's really good research out of the UK and also out of Canada on this, where they found that beaver wetlands do attenuate flood waves, and they do reduce the power of those events. That water obviously has to go somewhere. Uh, and most of the mechanisms that have been described are the water being pushed out onto the floodplain where it can seep into the soil, access those um, larger reservoirs that are sometimes untapped. I do see groundwater recharge being observed in the literature as well um, and elevated water tables. That's mostly driven by the dam itself, creating a high pressure situation where as water approaches it and it's difficult for it to flow downstream, it gets pushed downwards into the soil. If it can access a true groundwater flow path instead of just a shallow hyperion or a sort of shallow soil flow path, then you can get actual aquifer recharge around the ponds. I have a question about um, the you know, human-made artificial dams um, because you know the session we went to this morning about dams and dam removal was about their impact on fish and fish passage. Are, is there a conflict um, at times between fish passage and river dams in terms of accessing habitat, or is it mostly not river connected? That is a good question. That's I'm going to be honest that that's a little bit outside of my expertise. Actually, it, a lot of what I have seen in the literature um, seems to suggest that these beaver dam analogs are actually beneficial for fish um, because they're going to have some benefits for, for stream temperature. Um, but Emily, I don't know if you've seen much about this. Is this a... Yeah, so... Beavers in North America have been building their dams and engineering this continent for at least 7 million years, and there's some fossils that suggest it could be 24 million years. If the fish that are also native here couldn't coexist with the number of beavers that were on this continent, they probably wouldn't be here today. Um, so there is some amount of just ability to coexist with one another. There also, especially in the American West, we have observed significant benefits from having these flow obstructions of the beaver dam. Fish can get past them. Baby fish swim through them. They're a lot more porous than a lot of people think. There's little pipes, not real pipes, like mm -hmm. water, <laughs> water pipe-ish things that go through the beaver dam. Um, and fish swim right through that. And we will see fish go through that on cameras. We will have fish that are pit tagged or like little tracker tags. And we see them downstream and then we see them upstream. And they never took one of the side channels around. They can take the side channels too. So in addition to damming, beavers are master excavators and they are constantly digging little canals out from their ponds into the rest of the valley bottom. And those are like little water highways. The beavers take them because they also don't want to go up and down over their dam. Beavers are awkward. Uh, but fish and amphibians and other things take them too. So there's a lot of ways to bypass the beaver dam, even if they cannot jump over it like classic Western salmon style. The real conflict with fish passage happens when you have a really severe drought because then you've dropped your flow conditions, those canals might run dry, and you can have fish that get stranded within the beaver pond. But in those conditions, it's also valuable to take that bigger context and look back and think, well, if we're losing flow across this system and it's that stressful of a hydrologic event, would you rather have your fish stranded in a potentially drying stream or would you rather have them stranded in a deep pool? And so it'd be great if the drought didn't happen, but when it does and those fish can't pass the dams, most of them aren't trying to pass the dams anyways. So with these fish passages to follow up, um, 
We talk about little fish being able to swim through dams. The big fish can use these highways, or have been observed mm -hmm. using yep. the highways to get up to this one. Yep, they also do jump the beaver dams. The average beaver dam is under a meter tall. Um, and if you've seen the salmon do yeah. their runs, like they can handle that. Just, um, yeah, going to the beaver dam analogs, I'm curious, like, what are the challenges to getting more of these out on the landscape? Like, what's keeping that up? And then, second is more specific um, can they be used? to remedy incised rivers, because I know that's a big issue out in the West. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll address that first question, um, or the second question first. So can they be used to to um, restore incised rivers? That's something that we're hoping to see. That's, again, sort of an open question with these structures. Um, we have been installing them across the US for a while, and there's evidence that this type of structure may have been used, I mean, we're talking like decades ago, sort of sort of colloquially, um, but we don't have a lot of scientific evidence of, of what these structures actually do in terms of geomorphological change. There's a lot of sort of colloquial or, or qualitative information. We're trying to really get to that those quantitative estimates. Um, we know it takes time. So we are two years into monitoring at our field site and the changes that we've seen are crazy. Like first year I was, I was a little nervous. This last year we went back and it, I mean, the amount of sediment that has been moved and the change that we observed um, was, was impressive. Um, and so I, I do think that that is in the future. We don't have direct evidence now, but what we know from sort of geomorphological theory is, is that should happen. Um, we'll continue to sort of grade and build up sediment. We'll allow the, the stream to become more sinuous and um, to continue to sort of build up over time. And then can you remind me of your first question? Just uh, in general, the challenges to getting more of these analogs. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Emily, you might have thoughts on this too. Um, I know the, the problems that we ran into, at least in Wyoming, are it's, it's right, we call them beaver dam analogs a lot of times. And Beaver can sometimes be a bad word, depending on where you are. Dam can really be a bad word um, in, in a lot of places. So um, permitting, I know, was a big challenge for the Nature Conservancy when they were trying to get these things um, in because people see the word dam and they're thinking, right, they're thinking an obstruction, something that's going to cause problems. Um, there's a lot of worries about access to water. And so if we're saying we're going to hold this water back upstream, downstream landowners get, get nervous. Um, I really don't think the amount of, of water, we're not changing that in a, in a significant way. Um, we need more work to sort of be able to show that. And I think to be able to reassure, reassure folks downstream because water is precious, right? Our liquid gold. Um, Emily, I don't know if you you have other thoughts on challenges to... Always permitting. Yeah. It's always permitting. Yeah. And it gets more complicated because a lot of times you want this restoration structure in a place with threatened and endangered species. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you're working in water, it's a special permit, or it's a more complicated permit process. As soon as there's a single threatened or endangered species, it's a more complicated permit process. So most of the groups that I've worked with and helped think about these projects, they start the permitting process almost a year out to make sure that they get it all in order in time for the in-water work window, and they can get it installed. And it's a barrier to have to plan a year out for a restoration structure. And the other thing about beaver dam analogs is that they are they require maintenance. And you mentioned this a little bit. A beaver is always working to like, upkeep its dam and like keep it you know functional. And a beaver dam analog that we have built requires us to upkeep it, mm -hmm. which is a lot of time and investment. Um, and so you know, letting beavers do the work for you, uh, maybe it's, <laughs> we like the bang combo for your butt. We like the combo. We like yeah. the combo of beaver dam analogs, yeah. bring in a beaver, let them take it over. Exactly. Emily, can you spell the, the location where the beaver reintroduction? Oh, Tasman Poem? Yeah. I can try. There are accents over some of the letters. Okay. Um, it is T-A-S-M-A-M and then K-O-Y-O-N. Okay. If you Google that and I'm wrong, it'll be close enough that you'll be able to find it. <laughs> as long as it doesn't get spell checked, which right. you always said. <laughs> Thank you. Do you guys know of any similar? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, any um, uh, efforts going on in New England, where I'm from? Because we seem to have a lot of beavers that we don't need to replace or put more beavers in. But is there any similar work that you know of going on in the Northeast? Yes. 
Um, All right, there is. go. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the larger nonprofits that organizes around beaver conservation is actually based in New England. It's called the Beaver Institute. And uh, they, uh, they do a lot of really important work. One of the things that you mentioned, so yes, we have a lot more beavers in the eastern half of the United States. And so reintroduction is not usually the concern. It's more about coexistence. And so the Beaver Institute has really been leading the charge on training people to build coexistent structures, which are things like pond levelers or how to correctly wrap your tree in fencing so that a beaver is not going to chew on it. And then also just a huge amount of education. There are so many myths about what beavers do and don't do out there still. And oftentimes beavers are being legally managed for things that are not actually a problem with the beavers. We've seen people request permits to remove them because they think they eat fish, for example. Mm -hmm. Beavers do not eat fish. Um, it's an unfounded concern, but it permeates through a lot of places. And so there's conservation work being done in those realms in the East Coast. Um, they The coexistent structures is really where they're shining. There's a lot of different issues with beavers damming culverts, beavers damming you know, a nice little nick point in the road and then flooding the road and figuring out how we can out engineer them in a sustainable way that doesn't require a lot of maintenance. That's the East Coast challenge. Was it a pond leveler? A pond leveler. Um, wow. <laughs> funny you ask. Um, these are, so I'm going to preface this by saying beavers are really, really good engineers and they're elegant engineers in what they do. Um, we are also really good engineers. I don't know that I would describe a pond leveler as elegant. <laughs> so what you do for a pond leveler is you put a notch in the beaver dam and then you run a large diameter sewer pipe through it and you put one end all the way out in their pond and then you put a cage around it and then sink it to the bottom of their pond. You have perforated holes all along this pipe. Then the other end, you take over their dam, the downstream a little bit, also put a gauge on it, also sink it if you can, hold it down with like cinder blocks. And then you are setting that pipe height at the level you want the pond at. If they try to build it too much higher or they try to pond water more than that, the pipe will drain that water off. So we basically put a little tap on the beaver pond to keep it at the level that we want it at. These are sometimes thwarted by beavers that find the pipes and chew the pipes. And so the correct amount of fencing and strategic fencing is important, but these are highly effective conflict mitigation tools when the issue is flooding. If you've got beavers and they have this beautiful wetland and they just start to get some water on the road or someone's basement, pond leveling it is cheap. It's about $1,000 to build one of these things and they can last for decades. And you can reduce that flooding concept, keep the beavers on site, keep the ecosystem services, but not be causing damage to human infrastructure. What uh, is, I mean, I don't know what the right frame is, the West or California, or if anybody's looked at this, what is the potential for restoration in terms of public private land, people that might want this or not want this, like, yeah, what's the opportunity? I think the potential for restoration is very high. Um, it definitely varies from state to state, and there are places where we don't truly know the potential for restoration. And so, like with some of this ancient beaver DNA work, one of the things we are trying to find out is where were their beavers in the past and how long have they been absent and can we bring them back? With the beaver dam analog construction, a lot of that is can we entice beavers back into the landscapes where we wanna have them? And with modeling their benefits for drought resilience and water storage, like we're all trying to answer this question of how much benefit can we have from beavers? We know we're only at 10% the historic population, but we don't know what that means in terms of ecosystem services. And also evidence by ecosystem services um, increase in uh, effect over time. And we don't really know what the limit of that is. So most beaver dams have only been around for a few decades, have only been studied for a few decades. We don't really know how, you know, where we start seeing things leveling off or changing in terms of how much water storage we get, how much sediment, carbon storage, that kind of thing. Uh, we need longer term studies to really understand that. Sure, we're showing any of that in the sediment. So that's sort of a future plan. Yeah, so now that we've shown that we can use this method to understand, but like the first thing that we showed was we see beavers in one watershed for 5,000 years. And so you can imagine it's like one watershed, 5,000 years of engineering, there's gotta be a lot going on. And so future work, we're gonna look at uh, the carbon storage and the sedimentation rate and forest fires um, and see what kind of long-term changes we see with that kind of engineering. Yeah. Leah, yeah. yeah. So um, Emily, I have a question about your work with Google on a machine learning model to count mm -hmm. beaver dam. Can you tell us a little bit about the expertise that Google has provided? And then if I understand it, Google, if you're using Google Earth, those are older satellites, 
photos mm -hmm. and um, could this be applied to you know daily satellite photos like that are created by Cyan and other satellite providers? Yeah, great questions. So the Google team has been really awesome because my expertise is the beavers uh, and Google's expertise is pretty much all of the machine learning work uh, and figuring out how to actually operationalize this in a way that is cost effective enough to make it usable um, that uses data that is not overly complicated. You know, the simplest model, the most elegant model, that's what we're going for. So our model is built on just visual like RGB imagery and then a slope layer and uh, so they brought a lot of that to the table. They also do a lot of the computing time. I forgot the second half of your question. <laughs> and then would you apply this to more um, daily satellite? Oh, yeah, yeah. Frequent yeah, so with Google Earth Pro, the imagery is actually quite good, and it is being updated fairly often. And it's that super high-res stuff that we get from like MaxR and Airbus that is really good for identifying the beaver dams. In some of those images, you can see individual sticks within the dams, and that is a really good clue that you know exactly what you're looking at. With Planet, it is very high resolution. I can identify beaver wetlands in that if they are large wetlands, but it's a lot harder to get the more uh, emergent ones, the smaller dams, the secondaries, and to really get a full picture of that. The resolution that I would say is ideal for mapping dams is going to be 0.6 meters or less. Uh, sometimes you can get them in one meter resolution, sometimes you can see them in Three meter resolution in some super massive beaver ponds, I can see them in Sentinel, which is 10 by 10, but uh, the finer the better and the more confident we can be. So, so you need Maxar and Airbus data really to be the super high risk stuff? At least for now. We're hoping that over time, if we can map it out in enough different places and in enough different settings, that the model will pick up on enough cues that even if the image quality is lesser, we can still find those dams with relatively good confidence on a fuzzier image. Hi. Um, so some preface to my question, after the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980, there was like 20 years where it was a crazy landscape and the beavers moved in and actually changed the way that water was structured there. And that was a huge disturbance, you know? So I'm wondering, do beavers like disturbance and what attracts beavers to take over a place in places that they hadn't been in a long time? Uh, yeah, beavers love disturbance. They're pretty high drama. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, volcanic eruptions is probably on the upper end of what they enjoy. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that we see, at least in places like Minnesota, is that when you do have a fire come through and that fire burns off some of the pine forest, beavers love to move into that immediately afterwards because it makes open space that lets some of their preferred food sources grow. And so I imagine on Mount St. Helens, when you had a lot of closed canopy forest, it was harder for them to have those riparian food species established. Volcano comes does a very effective job of removing the vegetation. That means that you're going to get more herbaceous stuff coming in right away. The beavers like to eat that. They have this opportunity and they seize it and they're very mobile. So they do like disturbance. They can deal with disturbance pretty well. So it doesn't bother them the same way it bothers other species. And, you know, once they're there, they are sort of taking control of that landscape to an extent, and it's easier to take control when you're the main driving force in it and not when all the other ecological processes have established. As a follow-up, has anyone looked at introducing beavers like right after a wildfire event or something to help plants grow back or anything like that? Yeah, so physically reintroducing the beavers right after wildfire uh, is a little bit dicey on the ethical side because right. it's not great habitat for them. However, beaver dam analogs are installed post-fire to help with catching some of that sediment and especially the ash and keeping it out of the downstream area. They're sometimes viewed as like an emergency post-restoration structure and they can reverse a lot of incision in a short amount of time because of the extremely high sediment loads post-fire. This was done uh, up in the bootleg fire in Oregon in 2021. They had a number of beavers in those systems already. And where there were beaver ponds, it was healthy preserved habitat. There's some great photos of it. Um, you can contact Trout Unlimited's Charlie Erdman for those. Um, and then on other streams where there weren't beaver, they had significant burning. They observed that the fish were alive and healthy within the beaver dammed reaches, and the fish had been suffocated by the ash in the undammed reaches. And so as soon as this observation was made, it was all hands on deck getting beaver dam analogs out to try to save the fish populations. Given, and I 
He said they were highly mobile. And I was wondering what that means exactly. How far can they walk? <laughs> they are highly mobile, but not walking. Um, <laughs> so beavers are a pretty awkward animal. They've got uh, webbed back feet, big paddle tail, low grabby hands, body shaped like a bowling ball, 100 pounds, <laughs> max weight, not for land travel. Um, <laughs> over land, I would consider them immobile. Um, but within the water, they're extremely mobile. So when they are a sort of sub-adult beaver ready to disperse and start their own family, they will go anywhere from 10 kilometers to 100 kilometers away to do that, and they just take the river network. They're going to be going downriver, upriver, up the tributaries, down the tributaries. We do see them walk across divides between watersheds, so they will get out of the water and go to another watershed if they have to, but they would prefer not to. They would prefer to take the tributary down, get a connecting stream, and then go up a different tributary because they're very vulnerable on land. Mm. So you mentioned the relocations were um, beavers that were in conflict zones. I'm wondering what some of, you've alluded to some of them, but what some of those zones are and what the conflict have been. Yeah. Um, so I've gone through a lot of the depredation permit data for a variety of states, including California, and read the reasons that people are requesting these permits. And a lot of those reasons are about chewing. Uh, people, especially like orchard owners, don't want all of their trees to be chewed on. And for a long time, there wasn't really any guidance of what you can do to stop that other than remove the beavers by killing them. So a lot of that kind of conflict drives uh, depredation and is a good opportunity for relocation. Because if this is going to be an ongoing conflict, that landowner does not want to coexist with the beaver for whatever reason, you might as well take those beavers and give them another shot somewhere else. Plugging culverts is another issue that we see. Um, that one we're working more to encourage coexistence because we do have things like beaver deceivers and fencing that can help keep the beaver off and mitigate the conflict. We also see uh, burrowing in levees. That's a really challenging one. We're not totally sure how to, we're not even sure if it's a problem or not, but we see them doing it and makes us nervous. Um, and so that's another conflict situation. And then occasionally we do see uh, where there's sort of a balance. You have a threatened or an endangered species on site that uh, is not able to live in beaver habitat, and yet it's currently living within the river corridor. So if beavers come and turn that into a wetland, and that's not good habitat for them anymore, even though the beaver's engaging in the natural behavior, if this is a very sensitive or threatened species. Sometimes the decision is made to move the beaver and let that species try to persist. What kind of what species? No, I'm not a bird person, but it's a bird. I don't remember <laughs> what bird it is. Um, there, one of the sites, and one of the permits that's often issued in California in recent years has been this bird, and it requires um, tall standing tree habitat, and it has made its home in the floodplain forest that hadn't been disturbed in a long time. Beaver comes in, starts chewing the trees. Um, beavers are allowed to chew trees. Bird is allowed to want trees. Uh, but when you only have one of the bird and you have, you know, 15 of the beavers, sometimes you got to protect the bird. So thinking about both funding and interest, given there's potential fire benefit or carbon benefit or flood river restoration benefit, is there dovetailing with like, are you seeing people writing beavers into those plans or at least is that a way to provide funding or, you know, impetus for this type of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So when California Fish and Wildlife uh, changed their policy on beaver relocation and established the beaver restoration program. They explicitly called out climate mitigation as one of the big motivators for that move. And uh, since that point, U.S. Forest Service, CAL FIRE, a lot of other agencies have expressed interest in this. There's a lot of thoughts about if you're doing forest thinning anyways for wildfire mitigation work, can you then use those materials to build beaver dam analogs to the parasite to do a beaver relocation? And like, how can we actually stitch all of these efforts together to get the most bang for our buck on this because climate change is pretty intense right now and we got to move fast and move efficiently. Um, so I have seen a lot of interest in a variety of places for people to explicitly write in beaver reintroduction, beaver dam analog, those kinds of things as a way to build that climate resilience or to prepare landscapes to be more resistant to wildfire, especially. But it's early. It is early. It's definitely starting. And if you go like down to smaller spatial scales, there are already watersheds that have been doing this for a decade. And it's just not some sort of large sweeping statewide or you know national program. People are aware of this. The Tulalip tribes in Washington have been relocating beavers for a long time, um, both for bringing beavers back to the watersheds they belong in, but also for drought mitigation. And so this is not brand new stuff. It's just stuff that's sort of 
picking up momentum at larger scales. Um, are, do beavers uh, stay put when you relocate them? A lot of species like <laughs> sea otters are famous. They like. <laughs> um, so when we relocate beavers, we have a few different measures of success. One of the measures of success is did the beavers live? Another measure of success is did the beavers stay on site? And then another measure of success is are they engineering it? Are they building dams? Are they digging canals, et cetera? It's pretty easy to hit the first one. Beavers can live very fine just through a relocation. Um, getting them to stay is hard. They like to bolt. They are highly mobile. Um, and if they don't like where you put them, they will leave. So you encourage them to stay at a site with structures like beaver dam analogs. They want to be working really efficiently when they're first dropped off at a site. They are nervous. They're looking for shelter. The more you can make your drop site look like an abandoned beaver wetland, the more likely those beavers are going to stay there and they're going to try to turn it into an active beaver wetland. So like with the California relocation that just happened, they're at the site, they're alive, they're doing their engineering. We hit all three measures of success. It took a lot of planning to get there. Um, if you're doing these really fast without a lot of planning, you'll probably hit that first measure of having them survive, but getting them to stay is going to be less likely. Um, just going to say, do you also include some kind of, I forget what they're called, but it's the hut in the middle of the lodge. Like a little pseudo lodge? Yeah, the lodge. Maybe they're in a lodge or where they have to go back and forth. You know, it's back and forth on if the fake lodges are helpful or not, because people have put them out during relocations to give them that shelter. And a lot of times the beavers are just completely uninterested in them. <laughs> um, what we found is that when you put out some sort of a structure that provides a bit of shelter, but isn't necessarily like a pseudo lodge, they really like that. So if you can bring a bunch of building material that's also food, so like aspen cuttings, willow cuttings, and pile it up, but sort of lean it against a tree or another rock or something, so there's a little cave underneath, they will use that for shelter. We see them dig a bank den in about a day though. They only need it for the first day. You don't have to have it there for weeks. Um, they're very, very fast excavators. Can I add what you each like about beavers? Or if you don't like them, you can forget that. We all like them. <laughs> I think there's so much, excuse me, there's so much, so many species these days that are of conservation concern. We're always worried about, you know, declining diversity, declining numbers, and species, or uh, beavers are such a conservation hope. You know, they are doing well themselves. They create habitat for other species. They are helping us, you know, mitigate climate change. They're very, they're very hopeful species to work with. I think my favorite thing about beavers is how relatable they are. Uh, if you spend a lot of time watching them in the field, or like I have game cameras out, you see behaviors that like you recognize. Like you see siblings squabbling with each other, and I'm like, oh yeah, that was me and my sister growing up. Or you see them like really trying to reach for their favorite food on the top shelf, or like the willow branch that's a little too high and they just can't get there. Um, or you see them working hard and doing everything they can to make themselves a safe home. And you just realize that this animal is doing all the same things that we do. And it's really nice to feel that connection to an animal. I love how cute they are, <laughs> I have to say. Um, they're very baby, Yeah, Google baby beavers. <laughs> it's very great. Um, I also like that they're this connector between freshwater and terrestrial habitat. So they're kind of go between the water and the land. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And they, you know, change their environment to suit them. And then everything else is kind of adapted around having beavers on the landscape, which I think is really cool. Um, and it's just, I'm endlessly fascinated by um, what beavers are doing. And the fact that they're all over North America is, or most of North America is, also really interesting. They're so adaptable. They can go where they go like wherever they want, kind of, which is really cool. I I love that they're showing us up as engineers, right? Like yeah. like this is this is good for the civil engineers to know. And and we, right, as humans, we think we're coming up with solutions to things. And a lot of times we we end up creating more problems, right? Dams can be helpful in some cases, but we're taking them all out all over the place. Beavers are coming in and and they are the true, the true engineers. Can I actually ask a quick follow up to that question directly? Um, Alex asked about disturbance, and then I think you were asking about, you know, like what's sort of the crossover with other like environmental concerns and funding. So we are looking to remove a lot of dams, especially smaller dams across the US. Is that like if those dams are removed, is that creating more potential beaver habitat? 
I can answer this. Um, yes, it is. So when these dams are removed, that opens up a lot of space, uh, like a big disturbance, kind of like a little volcanic eruption happens there. And the beavers love to move into those spaces. And if people are ready to embrace the beavers in those spaces, it can be really beneficial for that post dam removal recovery. When the Elwha Dam came down, uh, beavers moved in pretty quickly afterwards and started creating critical wetland habitat very promptly. And in some ways that they were working, it can actually be faster than people going in and doing riparian planting and doing sediment mobilization efforts. So beavers are sort of our partners when we take down the dams. Um, I'm sure that they appreciate it. Like that dam is beyond what they would ever imagine for themselves. And us taking it out gives them a lot more opportunity to build the right scale of dam for those watersheds. It's an interesting implications for the East Coast too, right? Instead of taking out really big dams in the East, we're focused on those little mill dams, like the really low head stuff. And so I, I don't know, it's, it sort of remains to be seen how how that will change in the Eastern um, US, but but certainly opportunities. Any more questions? Any online? I do have one more. I actually wanted to throw it back to Neve, and apologies if I missed this um, in your brief introduction, but um, you know, you mentioned that your you have evidence that beavers have been present in one watershed continuously for five thousand years. Um, can you tell us, like, did you look at other watersheds? Like, is that one unique? And what changes, um, you know, climatic changes did that watershed experience that the beavers sort of made it through? Yeah, so I, I tried to skim over pretty quick, but we looked at three watersheds <clears throat> within Grand Teton National Park, one of which is at high elevation. We didn't expect to see beavers there. We didn't see beavers there. Um, and then two that were at lower elevation um, in good beaver habitat, with good beaver habitat above these lakes. And so we looked at the, the sedimentary DNA record over 10,000 years. And so we see beavers showing up around the mid-Holocene, which is also, we see what's called a neoglacial advance in the region. Basically, the glaciers in the area started growing again in the middle of the Holocene, probably due to more snowpack and more winter precipitation. And so we see the beavers showing up, probably due to more of the snow melt coming down at the same time. And then uh, there's been these multi-century droughts documented in the region in the late Holocene, but in one of our lakes, which is quite small, um, it seems that the beavers are persisting throughout these potentially multi-century droughts. So really extended various climatic changes. We see the beavers staying there. We see the riparian habitat staying there. Um, and we don't see this in, uh, we didn't see this in the other lake we looked at, which is a bigger system. So beavers are potentially less controlling in that system. So it's cool. Great, okay, last call for questions. Nicola, yeah. At risk of exposing the ignorance about beavers, mm -hmm. um, is there work going on in other countries around the world um, on beaver reintroductions to the United States, like ahead of the game, behind the game? Yeah, there's quite a lot of work going on in Canada, and um, beavers are native across North America, and there's some work in the UK, especially, where beavers are also native. Um, and the beavers are invasive in South America, so mm -hmm. there's some uh, beaver work to remove beavers in South America because they don't belong down there. Um, but uh, in North America and Europe, that's what I'm aware of. Do you know anything else? Also in Mexico and Mongolia. Ooh, Mongolia. I never heard of that. Yeah. That's cool. How did the beavers get to Mongolia? Beavers used to be abundant all across Eurasia. Huh. Um, the North American beaver is actually thought to be from the Eurasian beaver coming across the land bridge and then uh -huh. genetically separating. And so throughout history, there were sort of three waves of fur trade. The first was in East Asia and then Europe and then North America. And every single time beavers were significantly affected. So they were nearly extinct in East Asia, then they were nearly extinct in Europe, and then they were nearly extinct in North America. And then the recovery has been happening in the opposite direction. So there were more of them left in North America. And so North America is bouncing back fastest. And then Europe, they're being really intentional with reintroduction. And then in East Asia, there's still so many questions about where they even were because they've been gone for about a thousand years there. Mm -hmm. um, but there's like local community activists in Mongolia trying to bring them back and people really just trying to understand what was their history of beaver and what is their role in those landscapes today after such mm -hmm. a prolonged absence. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us at this roundtable. Thanks to our panelists and thanks all of them for joining us here in San Francisco. It's been a wonderful time seeing everyone. We do have uh, two media availabilities tomorrow. This is our last sort of official event, um, but Cindy Labs tomorrow at 10 a.m. We'll be talking about using fiber optic cables to monitor seafloor permafrost. 
then at 2 p.m., Pam Melroy, the NASA Deputy Administrator, will be available following her plenary talk uh, down near the plenary room. And of course, our next event is the Ocean Sciences meeting in February in Nor New Orleans. So maybe we'll see some of you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.